series um, for the next three weeks. But before I uh, get going, I need to uh, publicly uh, do this before I, you know, forget to do this. And it's super important, and you know quickly why. But uh, I want to thank uh, Megan, <coughs> which is my, my wife, um, for being the best uh, mother and teacher uh, to my children and uh, being my amazing wife, uh, the one of the loves of my life, uh, one of my, my best friend, my partner, and she's such an amazing, uh, great uh, sister in Christ to me as well. Uh, today's our anniversary, if, you, if you're wondering why I'm just pointing this out. Um, so, uh, 12 years of marital bliss, right honey? Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of the, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this movie, it's probably, I don't, I can't remember, 15 years old probably, um, but it's uh, My Big Fat uh, Greek Wedding, and uh, it was just such a hilarious movie when it first came out, and it's one of those low budget movies that somehow were fantastic, and, and so, but there's a, there's a scene in there that speaks highly of Megan and I's relationship, and uh, I'll just kind of set the scene for you, there's, the main character is having these urges to, uh, she's having these urges to kind of break away from the family mold, and it's a very tight-knit family, Greek family, and and the daughter's supposed to help run this cafe that the family owns, but she's feeling called to do more in her life, and so she wants to go to school, and she wants to uh, learn to do other businesses and to branch out, and so she goes to the mother, and she's crying to her mother, and uh, she's like, Mom, I just really want to do more with my life, And, and, and the mom's, you know, saying, oh, I understand that. She's like, but dad will never let me go because dad, you know, dad is the head of the house and he, it's his way or the highway and he's just never uh, will going to ever change his ways. And the mother goes, oh, 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 honey, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The man may be the head, but the woman is the neck and she can turn the head in any direction she wants. <laughs> and that is such an amazing quote and so true in my relationship, there are so many times that in, my, uh, in the 12 years I've made an authorita- authoritative proclamation as the head of the home, this is what it's going to be, and we're going to do this, and then I'll turn and look at Megan and see if she's agreeing with me or if she's giving me the stare of death <laughs> that the kids and I both fear greatly. And so you know, really know who is the true uh, head of the house if she's able to move the neck, and, and so, uh, but we, I just, I, I love her tremendously, and so we're going to be talking, though, about getting our head right, because I think so many times uh, our heads can become out of whack, and uh, whether it's alignment or maybe just mental, I'm really talking about mental, so over the next three weeks, I want to talk about how we can um, realize that our head's out of whack and what we can do in order to get it on straight, and I know Multiple times throughout my life, people have said, I don't know if this is a saying or if it's just something that people said to me, but I don't think that person's head's on straight. Someone's said that to me multiple times. I don't know, maybe it's just, uh, maybe it was just my grandparents or somebody, I, I don't know, but it was, you're, that, that, that head's not on straight. And um, that was said to me often, and I, I've, that's always stuck with me because that's true. There, there are times when you make mistakes, and this is not just when someone ran into a wall or something like that, or I think it was, that was one of the times it was said, but it's also when the person uh, does something that doesn't make any sense. Are you kidding me? Like, why would you ever do that? that his head must not be on straight. And the answer, the question is, to, the, to this question that I have for us is, how do we get our heads on straight? Because there are times where it does become out of line. There are times that our thinking, our thoughts, and uh, just our motivation becomes skewed and messed up. And so what is the neck to our head when our heads are not on straight? So what's the neck that's going to put on? Who's in control of our neck that puts our head on straight? And the answer is simply, I'm going to end the sermon right here. It's you. Okay, let's go home. No, no, I can't do that. Um, but the head, our neck is not someone else. It's not, it's not a wife or a husband, and it's really not even God. Our neck that turns our head and puts our head back on place is actually yourself. It's you able to control your own thoughts and mind because our thoughts greatly impact our lives. And they come from you. What you let in and what you think comes, comes from you. 
And so there are three awesome quotes that I found that kind of go with how important it is to control our thoughts. And one is from Henry Ford. It says, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Pretty good one. Teddy Roosevelt, believe you can and you're halfway there. Very true. And Marcus Aurelius, Roman, the happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. The happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. You know, for me, I'm my own worst enemy in a lot of different situations. Depending on how my mind and how my head is focused on things, I can get through pretty much anything. All right, if my head is. But if I have the word can't, I'm doomed for failure. If I start thinking I can't do anything, I'm going to give up. And I, I've tried to begin instilling that into my kids. And so when they come up to me and say, I can't, I always stop them and say, whoa, stop that. You can. We're going to get there. Stop saying that you can't because can't is the beginning of quitting and eventually defeat in our lives. Now, I'm, I'm fairly ridiculously competitive. I don't know if you guys have gotten that so far in my life or those of you who know me since I was a kid know how competitive I am, but it wasn't, I, that was something that was nurtured into me, and it was nurtured into me uh, through uh, being born into a family where I have an older brother who's five years older than me, and I, I've talked about this extensively. Because my older brother's five years older than me, I played with him, because I wasn't going to play dolls with my sister. So I was playing with my brother, and I wanted to be just like him, but the problem is, playing with someone five years older than you, he's well advanced physically, mentally, in every aspect of your life. So no matter what we did, I was dominated and lost every single time we played anything. I remember playing video games, and he'd beg me to play video games and play sports with him because he wanted someone else to play with. He didn't want to just be out there by himself. And so I'd play, and every single time, a video game, he'd destroy me in a video game, and I'd end up throwing it. and be like, I can't stand this. I'm losing every single time, or basketball, or baseball. And, and he would say, oh, Zach, pitch to me. And then We'd play like one-on-one -on -one baseball where I'd pitch to him and he'd hit a home run and I'd have to run and chase it to try to get him before he goes around the bases. And I'd never get three outs. And I'd throw my glove up in the air and be like, I quit. This is terrible. And so for years and years, I would lose all the time and wanted to quit. But then something amazing happened. Well, my brother got older and he started hanging out with older people and didn't want to hang out with me. And so then I began to hang out with people my own age and I realized that all those competitions with my older brother made me very, very good at what I did. And so when I started playing people that were my age, I was very successful because I was used to going against somebody that was so much better. And guess what? I really liked winning. After years and years of losing, I really like, whoa, this is great. And so I became even more competitive in this never, never giving up, never losing attitude became at the forefront of my mind and it began to be cultivated inside of me. And I realized that it's not just something that I can flip on and off in my life. It's something that has to continue to be developed in my life of, you know, whether it was in uh, something physical or a job or um, really any aspect of my life. I had to continue to push myself to have the I can't quit mindset. I'm going to win this. And so I kept building this in my mind because if I allowed myself to fail, and let it become like a lifestyle of failing, I became, started to play the victim card in my life. Oh, it's the whole world against me. I can't tell you how many students I've talked to that have said this to me, and it drives me bonkers, and I call them out every single time. The teacher hates me. I have an F because the teacher doesn't like me. Are you kidding me? The teacher doesn't want to give you an F because they probably don't want to see you again. Okay, they want you to move on. All right, so don't give me that. I'm like, are you, do you turn in your homework all the time? Well, sometimes. You know, or do you ever get in trouble in class? Well, I mean, yeah. It's your fault. It's not the teacher's fault. It's your own fault. But it's this victim mentality of, I've failed enough. I'm just going to give in and, and just be a failure. The woe is me mentality can control us and cause major problems in our life. One of the biggest Issues, though, for me in my life is I would easily go to battle for things that I can see. You know, a, a job, um, a, a sport, uh, to get in shape and to be healthy, to lose weight. I can, 
I can, I can really focus and, and crawl and fight and claw for um, those successes in life. But when it came to the spiritual aspect of my life, I wasn't claw, clawing and fighting and scratching for every inch in my spiritual walk because it was something that I couldn't see. It was something that I thought was supposed to come easy to me because if I accepted Jesus, isn't he supposed to carry me through the rest of the way? Isn't Jesus supposed to make it easy for me? I accepted you, so make it easy for me, right? If God is love, isn't he supposed to make all things right? Like, Why is it so hard then to follow Jesus, to be pure and righteous in his sight? I mean, I've given my life over to him. I'm trying to live for him. He's a loving God, and he wants me to live right, so shouldn't he make it easy for me? And I think a lot of the times we as, as people separate our lives from the physical and the spiritual, okay? The things that we can see, because I see a lot of fighters. When I just look at this world and I see what people overcome, I think about what Amanda just said, you know, her celebration, that's a fight. I mean, that's something we have to fight for. And I think of Jeff and him trying to get better and, and all these different things. That's, I mean, that's people fight and claw for different things. It's because something they can see physically. And so I think we've separated physical from spiritual, and we'll fight and claw for what's in the spiritual world, but we don't fight, fight and claw our way to success in the spiritual world. We think it should be handed to us. And I don't know if it's because we misinterpret scriptures like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, I, I think we take it out of context, because I think what we think it says is, God won't give us more than we can handle in life. And people think that, oh, so God's not going to, you know, and a lot of people come back and say, well, God thinks I can handle quite a bit. That's usually the comeback to that scripture. But what he's actually talking about is temptation. He's talking about temptations, not trials. He's talking about temptations. So sin, sinful temptations. And it says the temptations in your life are not different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more than we can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Okay, so he's talking about temptations. I think a lot of us think that God is supposed to, like I said, carry us and make this an easy walk through life. And so we separate that physical. And we're like, I'm going to fight and claw for the good things in this life. I'm going to fight and claw for the joys and the experiences I can have in this world. But on a spiritual aspect, I should be carried all the way because God's not going to give me more than I can handle. So, and I think we misinterpret what God allows us to go through. Because he's going to allow us to go through anything. He, multiple times he talks about molding us and making us, and he wants to sharpen our iron and form us. And if you want to make good, strong steel, you have to heat it up and almost melt it. I mean, it goes in the fire to become strong. And if God wants to make us strong, we have to go through the fire to make us be able to handle things of life. And uh, for whatever happens later on, however God wants to use us as we walk his road. But I think that we're not going into battle. I don't think we're ready to go into battle. I think we're walking into these fights, these spiritual fights, not even knowing we're walking into a war. I think we're just walking in thinking, oh, I'm just focused on this, the physical things. It's having a good life here. I'm focused on getting through this life, and we forget, man, there's a spiritual battle that, it, that our souls are being fought over every single day. And I'm talking, even if you've, even if you've given your life to Jesus, it doesn't mean Satan stops. It means he tries even harder. If he already has your soul, he's not going to fight for your soul. He's already got it. But if he doesn't have your soul, he's going to fight even harder and make your life terrible and attack you until he gets it back. I think about, uh, I might have told this story before, and I apologize if I have, but uh, for some reason when I was, I think I was, Megan can correct me. I don't know if McKinsey was born yet. So I probably was 24 or 25, but I decided that I wanted to run a half marathon. And I trained myself. Uh, to about seven or eight miles, and in case you don't know, half marathon's 13 miles, um, but I was like 24, I was pretty healthy, and I thought, I got this, Jolene's laughing, I'm like, I got this, and so I, 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 uh, I trained myself to about 13 miles, and I thought, oh man, I'm not even tired, I got this, so I ran this half marathon, and uh, I got to the, oh, nine mile marker and I actually they have these pace setters that run in front of you to tell you like what pace you're going and I didn't even know these existed because this is the first time I ever ran a race more than like a 5k and I'm running in this pace setter and it was like an hour and 30 minute pace marker at the eight mile mark and I'm like I'm like wow I'm doing awesome 
And so I'm running, and all of a sudden, as I get to about mile nine, something happens in my knee. And it like, I hear like a pop, and I'm like, oh, uh, oh boy. And I slow down, and I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just walk for a little bit. I'm like, oh, no, that hurts. I'm like, okay, that hurts, so let's try to run again. Oh, that hurts. Okay, so what am I going to do here? And I'm like, I told these people at church that were other people are running. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll make it. It'll be great. And so I had this pride and ego thing happening. I'm like, I got to finish this race or everyone's going to make fun of me. And so I hobbled along. No lie, I'm hobbling. And all these people, trainers and people are, are coming up to me with golf carts. They're like, you want to ride? Are you sure you want to be done? Are you okay? You need to see a trainer or whatever? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm fine. I got this. And I'm being like overcome with this pain. I mean, excruciating pain. And I drag myself and it comes into Memorial Stadium in Champaign. And uh, Megan is right there on the corner cheering me on. And I ended up spending the last three miles, ended up taking me an extra hour. An hour to do the last three miles as I'm dragging my right leg behind me. As I'm running. As I'm running, being dragged behind. And I get there and Megan's like, yay. Uh Uh-oh cheering for me, and I remember the moment I stepped onto the turf at Memorial Stadium, I'm like, it was like stepping onto a cloud of softness. I was like, oh, because my knee hurt so bad. I'm like, this is amazing. And I remember finished it and, and, and thought, man, you know what? I am so dumb to think that I could have made that without ever testing my body. And I talked to trainers and stuff like that, and they said, oh, you just have severe tendonitis. You didn't tear anything. You just have severe tendonitis because your body was not used used to running that much. And I thought, oh, yeah. And they're like, oh, and also, did you ever stretch? No. Oh, well, there you go. I came to battle without preparing my body. My mind was prepared. My body wasn't. And I stepped into that battle. And I love this uh, passage in, in Acts chapter 19, because I think we step into battle a lot, thinking that, or not even knowing that this is going to be a fight. I think we think we can handle it because Jesus is on our side, that in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we just say his name, we're, we're, we're going to be successful. And so we think we're going to like kind of skate into the finish line, and we're going to skate through this life and these trials and tests that we're going to go through being unscathed. And so I think about that verse in chapter uh, 19 of Acts, and and it's always stuck with me. It says, a group of Jews were traveling to the town, town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in an incantation. That's always a bad sign. Incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus in whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they, were fled, that they fled from their house naked and battered. I think a lot of times we come into this fight, this spiritual battle in our life, not even knowing, first of all, that we're in a battle, and we come in thinking that we're prepared just because of, we're one of Jesus' children, and we don't come in with the right mindset or even realizing that we're in a battle, and coming into a battle with Satan and his forces will, can easily destroy us if we're not prepared to fight, if we're not equipped to fight in his name mentally. There's many times where I've come home uh, from work, and, and Megan's been with the kids, and as I walk into the house, I'm, I'm in a great mood, and I walk into the house, and I can cut the tension with a knife as I walk in, and I'm like, what is going on? And, uh, and it's rare that I come home in a good mood, but it's, it's always, always when I come home in a good mood, something has happened, and oh, Zach, you need to spank the kids, or something like that has happened, and I'm like, oh, come on. And it's like I didn't even realize I had walked into a war and I'm like just walking through two, two enemies and two enemy lines, and I'm walking in as the fires are getting shot back and forth. And I'm like, what has just happened? What have I stepped into in this life? So we have all these trials in our life and temptations. There's a battle going on for our souls. And so, what should we do to prepare us? What do we need to do in order to have our heads on straight, in order to fight this battle and to have an understanding of what God desires from us? And I love 
what Romans 12 says. It says, not, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the Greek word for renewing is actually translated more into a, re- <coughs> excuse me, into a renovation. So the verse is actually saying that we need to have a mind undergoing renovation. And I know a lot of you may have done renovations in your home. Usually you want to change something or something may even be damaged or broken. And so you want to renovate it to change it to make it look better or to fix something that's broken. And so what Paul's saying here is that we have a renovation of our mind that needs to happen. Our thoughts, our mind need to be renovated and fixed. I think a lot of us, we focus on things that are damaged and broken. Our, our mind can be focused on things that are damaged, or our mind itself can be damaged and broken, and we just fixate on bad things, toxic things in our mind. And it destroys our mindset, and so when we go into battle, all we can focus on is the negatives in our mind and the things that we've done wrong or the things that someone else has done wrong to you or we compare ourselves to other people and so we have all these toxic thoughts in our mind that do not give us clear minds in order to fight in the battle that is ahead of us, the battle that we are in. I know every time that I've driven down here as an adult to Vandalia, I am often, I'll drive through down a street or through a neighborhood and I'm reminded of failures that I've made in my life mistakes that I wish I would not have made as I drive through different areas and and see things and I'm like, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. And I'm reminded of these things and I can't tell you how many times when I have thought about my time as as a teenager and I just thought, man, I wish I would have really lived for Jesus as passionately as I live for Jesus now. I wish I would have lived for Jesus then. So I see so many of my friends and classmates that have gone through difficult times and are still walking through difficult times in their life, and I wish, I I just think, man, if I would have lived for Jesus better, maybe he would have used me to reach their life, instead of being so focused on myself and, and the things that I wanted to increase in my own personal life, instead of being focused on what Jesus wanted to do with my life. Philippians, um, chapter three, Paul talks about how he has failed, and that he is trying to have a renewed mind in order to accomplish the perfection of Jesus dwelling inside of him. And so even Paul was trying to get to this place in his life. And so what can we do to get these negative thoughts and toxic thinking out of our minds so that we can be prepared and ready and our heads can be on straight? What can we do to turn our neck, so to speak, so that our thoughts and our focus are straight on and our minds are in tune with how Jesus wants us. And, and the simple answer is, well, we need to test our thoughts. We need to test our thoughts. We have a lot of thoughts every single day. I actually read a study that there's about, scientists that believe that we have about 60,000 thoughts per day. The human mind, about 60,000 thoughts per day, and that comes out to about 3,000 per hour. 3,000 thoughts per hour that we have of different things. I mean, I know all of you right now are thinking, what are we going to have for lunch? Or is Zach almost done? Or what's going on? You know, I mean, just constant thoughts. If you just think about these thoughts that you have constantly, I mean, that makes sense. And not all these thoughts are good. Some are good. Some, some of these thoughts help uplift other people and, and do good in our world. But some of these thoughts are quite toxic to us. And we have to test our thoughts. The main verse that I do want to focus on, and I know that scares you, I'm almost done, I promise. But the main verse, if you want to turn to it, is Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I'll give you a second to get there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Don't be scared, I'm almost done. But it's a way for us to test our thoughts. And this is what I want to leave you all with. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. On what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So, what do we fix our thoughts on? How do we get our mind, our head on straight? What do we need to do to get these toxic thoughts? How do we test? Test it to what Paul is telling us right here. Test it to 
Is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Excellent? Worthy of praise? Are the thoughts that I'm having one of these things? So true. One of the most important things to consider about our thoughts, are they true? Are they true thoughts? Too often our thoughts are just not true. We need to focus on what is authentic, what is real, and what lines up with God's word. Is the thought that I'm having, does it line up with the word of God, the truth that we know? Because some of the things that we hear in the world is not true. God's word is truth. So what does it line up with? The things of the world or the truth of his word? Is it noble? Because we are children of God, we're the highest rakes. Our thoughts should be royal and regal. Not just, not an arrogant way, but in a, allowing ourselves to think in an unkind and repulsive manner, but that we are children of of God. We are noble. So is it noble thoughts? Do we value who we are? Do we understand whose we are in Christ? That we are children of God. So are your thoughts of noble? Are they right? So many of us want to be right, but are your thoughts right? Thinking right thoughts means allowing accuracy and correctness to guide us. Do they permeate our thoughts of right thinking? Are they true, right thoughts? Are they pure? To be pure in heart and thought is not difficult as it seems. It's simply choosing to think righteously, to think as, is this right in God's eyes? Is this thinking right? Is this living right? Is this living good? Is this living upright? Is this thought upright? Is it honest in all things? Is it lovely? This is a word that isn't used much, lovely, but it should be. I think lovely, the thoughts means, is, is it beautiful? Is it stunning in life to allow our minds to think upon this? Is it, is it lovely? Is that thought a lovely thought? I often have to correct my children that that is not a lovely thought. Because what comes out of your mind is what comes out of your mouth. And the things that some of my kids say to each other is not lovely. Is your thoughts towards somebody else, even somebody that you don't like, is it lovely thoughts? Is it admirable? To be admired is something most of us desire, but do we want our thoughts to be admirable? Thoughts that are credible, distinguished, and allow us to live in such a way that is commendable. Is it excellent? The best of the best. When our thoughts are excellent, they are superb. Exceptional, they're fabulous. Excellent thoughts lead to excellent lives. Excellent thoughts lead to excellent lives. That's that I will not fail. I'm going to be excellent. That's one of our, I said a couple weeks ago, our, my four rules for the kids, our family rules, and one is do everything you do for the glory of the Lord. Do it as best of your ability. Think with the best of your ability. And lastly, worthy of praise What thoughts are worthy of praise? Thoughts about God, His ways, His plans, His creation, to name a few. It's safe to say that when our thoughts are on Him, that's a good thing. We can test our thoughts every day, and we need to root out the negative thoughts in each one of our lives. They easily come in, but if we test our thoughts, do they line up? Are they they true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, worthy of praise? And if they're not, we have to get rid of them. Surrendering them over to the Lord. Surrendering our thoughts over to the Lord and saying, God, I need your help. I'm putting my head on straight. My head is on straight. I know that I have bad, toxic thoughts in my head. And I want them out of here because I want to live for you. I want to do everything you desire. I want to go into battle not not realizing that I'm in a fight. I want to go in to be successful. And you're giving me everything I need to be successful. So help me have my thoughts. Help me have my head on straight. Help me be focused and uh, heading towards the mission and the finish line. Help me be with the right mind so that I can be successful. I love, and this is how I'm going to end, Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. It says, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Over the next week, I want to challenge you. Begin getting your head on straight. 
Remove the toxic thoughts in your mind. Okay? Start thinking about and evaluating what you think about every single day. Because, friends, we are in a spiritual battle. It's not just about clawing in this life. It's not just about clawing for success in this life. It's about being successful in our spiritual walk because eternity is much longer than you're going to live here on earth. Okay, so if there's anything we need to focus on is living for the eternal. Okay, and so I want to challenge you to fight and claw in the spiritual aspect, that it's stop, stop separating it and continue to realize that our life is one. I heard this, and, and uh, I assume that we're going to sing a closing song here, so go ahead and make your way up here if you're going to do that, please. Um, but this body that we live in, this body that we have, it's, it's really a rental home. And we need to understand that, that we all are, we all are going to pass away. We're all going to die. That's promise in this life. And this is not home. This body that my soul dwells in is not my home. My soul is who I am, not this body. This body is not who I am. It's the soul that dwells inside of my body. That is what is who I am. And so I want to scratch and claw for all of me. That is my soul, all of me. So I don't want to separate the spiritual and the physical, but I want to live for all of me. I want to live for my soul. And so I want you guys to pray with me and, and just see where your thoughts are. See where your head is. Does your head need to be focused? And do you understand that you're, you're being warred over, a battle over your soul right now? And are you willing to fight to have the I'm not going to lose mindset uh, to fight 